Why should the stories of Frank Lucas and Richie Roberts be told? I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> you know, I, what, you know I, 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 I think it's she's a good, looking at you. I, mean, I, I, I think I, it's I a good feel. story. You know, it's it's it, it's. I don't know who originally. Who was it? Was it based originally on this New Yorker article or New York Magazine yes. article? Yeah. I yes, just so. think that this that writer saw an interest. I, I, I'd be curious to see where he st or she started it, but was talking to one of them, talking to the other, realizing the connection. It's a unique connection between these two people, I mean, and, and how their lives came together and, and stayed together till, till this day. I just think it's a good story. Tell us about Frank Lucas, the way you're portraying him. What kind of man is he? And I mean, he's a pretty complex guy. Yes, he is. I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, I think he's a brilliant man who got, went off in the wrong direction, mastered that and, and, and paid the price for it. Uh, I think that he was very much, you know, as portrayed a family man who, who, who you know, he, he kept talking to me about America. He says, you know, I'm an American and I believe in it. I'm very patriotic. And, and yet he was, you know, responsible for destroying many Americans. He's, he is a complex man. He's your driver. Get rid of him. Come on, man. That's your cousin. He don't mean nothing to me. What's he gonna do? Go back home? I don't give a damn what he does. Send his ass home. Hey, 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 hey. On, don't rub on that. You block that. You understand? That's alpaca. That's $25,000 alpaca. You block that. Right. You don't rub on. Put the club soda on there. Look, I'll talk to him on that. Listen, from him now out. on, don't nobody talk to me directly. You understand? You got business with me. You talk to Huey. Huey, you talk to me. You got it? All right. Damn it, never on the phone. You got it? I got it. All right. And take them damn sunglasses off. Take the damn sunglasses damn off. Damn it, man. Yeah. And Richie, in his own right, is kind of a complex guy. Very honest, but at the same time troubled in his own life. Can you tell us about Richie? Um, I think Richie's sort of best understood by sort of examining his full journey, which is not necessarily what's in the movie. This movie's called American Gangster, and it's about the gangster, you know. But as a man, meeting Richie and getting to talk to him and, and understand where he, where he comes from and stuff, I sort of see him as, as a sort of a guy who believes greatly in his country, you know, and enjoying himself in many of the institutions of the country, the Marine Corps, the police force, the prosecutor's office, you know, and wasn't satisfied with what he saw with it, but instead of um, turning against his country, right, um, found a place where he could be a patriot, you know, and for him, that is being a defense attorney. That's, you know, being an advocate for people who don't have a voice. And it's defending sometimes the indefensible because that's the right you have when you live in this country. You know? Let me ask you this. Do you really think that putting me behind bars is going to change anything on them streets? Them dope fiends are going to shoot it, they're going to steal from it, they're going to die for it. Put me in or out ain't going to change one thing. And that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. So what we got, Richie? We got me and you sitting here. I got possession, supply. Conspiracy, bribing a law officer. I got people who attest to seeing you kill in cold blood. I got your offshore bank accounts, your real estate, your businesses, all bought with money from heroin. And I got hundreds of parents of dead kids, addicts who OD'd on your product, and that's my story for the jury. That's how I make it all stick. This man murdered thousands of people, and he did it from a penthouse driving a Lincoln. Aside from that, you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> that's pretty good, but that's why we go to court, isn't it, Richie? Because I got witnesses, too. I got celebrities, I got sports figures, I got Harlem, Richie. I took care of Harlem, so Harlem's gonna take care of me, you can believe that. Give him the strength, though, to confront all that corruption. I think that's a really small thing. I don't think that's a gigantic thing. That's just something that was rubbing him up the wrong way, you know? Because he had the badge, and he took the oath, and he was there to protect and serve, you know? And there's other guys who are, you know, doing something else. And just over time, it really started to get on his, you know, on his wick. Do you say that here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you do we where do I now. come from. <laughs> get on his wick. He got on his wick. Started to burn him. You know? Right, right. And it became this thing where, where you know, he saw that the greatest service that he could do at that time was, you know, was uh, bring that corruption down. How long of a period? Of time, I'm sound like I'm doing the interview. How long of a period of time was it from? 
I mean, this, obviously it was over years that he saw what was going on. It was not like it happened mm -hmm. on Tuesday and the next week he was, he was, how long a period of time was that? Well, it's you the know? length of time uh, that it took him to get his law degree at night, but he's still a policeman. Right, but I mean, I was like five years, ten years, five years, about yeah. five years. And before he was officially a cop, he still had a, a badge and a gun, and he was doing undercover prior. Mm -hmm. You know, he did undercover work for two and a half years before he went to the police academy. So you know? while he was doing night school, that's when he saw like the like the uh, Josh Brolin's character when he saw what they were doing and all that. In that period, but I think one of his major drives to go to night school in the first place was to realize that he could not survive as a regular cop okay. because these other guys didn't see the job the way he saw it. Okay. Wow. Mm. That was great. Man, was really I was just curious as he was talking about it. See, that's yeah. not as generic as they thought they were going to get. Yeah. 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 Anything else you want me to ask? Yeah, I actually... <laughs> 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 what, what I wanted to ask you is... No, the only reason I said it because I am i didn't... You know, it's, it's, it's almost like two movies. Yeah. And I, I purposely... I didn't talk to Richie too much because I didn't want to. You know, I'm like, I'm over here, I'm selling dope, I'll meet Richie when I get caught. You know, so I didn't know a lot about mm -hmm. his side of it and how well, he I took was. the same attitude with Frank as well. Yeah. He says, I want to be charmed by this guy. Exactly. I don't want to look in this guy's eye and feel right. sympathy or empathy right. for him because right. right. I'm on chase with this guy. Right. Exactly. You know, so I see him in the distance, I wave or whatever. Right, right. I didn't engage in any conversations. Right. Know? He probably felt that too. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, what a unique thing to be able to but have. But he didn't know the reason for it now. Mm -hmm. He yeah. does now. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, was it a really unique thing for <laughs> you guys to have these Do you mind if we send this to Frank? <laughs> we'll send sure, you can say it to Frank. Frank needs to see this. <laughs> well, I want to hear about Frank. When you right. first met this guy, mm -hmm. what was it like looking him in the eye, talking to him? Well, you know, waiting to see, you know, he was real, he was, he, 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 first of all, he's a charmer. You know, he's always, oh, Mr. Washington, you know, Mr. Washington, I'm just, I'm just hoping Mr. Washington, you know, and then you start getting below the surface of that, and he brought some of his cousins or family members around, and then they would start to talk about something. He's like, hey, 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 we're not going to talk about that. I'm like, good. We don't want to talk about that because I don't want to know. But uh, he just, he, he's just got this powerful personality. He'll start off seeming very humble and small, but he'll, he'll end up running the whole room. He's got to run the room. Or he, and he said it, you know, he wouldn't go to big events. He said he wouldn't go to his own club if there was somebody there that was, like, a lot more famous than him, unless it was him controlling. You know, he had to control things. He had to be in charge. He was a tremendous ego. Brian Grazer, I mean, without his tenacity to make this movie, it wouldn't have been made. Talk about his talent as a producer. Well, this is my third movie with Brian. You know, we uh, did A Beautiful Mind together, Cinderella Man, now this. When he called me about this, it was just after the second production had hit the deck, you know. And I think the line that he used is that his storytelling instincts were on fire. And he just knew that this was a movie that, that should be made. And just knew that, that Frank Lucas was a character destined for cinema, you know. So because we're friends, and even though I had read it a couple of times before under two different names, um, I think one was called True Blue? Yeah, True Blue, but then there was also somebody who was tripping around with The Return of Superfly, like the, oh, yeah. the title of the original article as well. Mm -hmm. um, what got me first in that, that third conversation was the fact that the, there was a new title, and I could see the possibilities as he could see them um, through that title. You know, Brian's job is kind of like a, in an odd way, he's sort of like an old-fashioned patron. He's like a Medici, you know what I mean? He sets a a platform for artists mm -hmm. to work with him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more creative the patron, you know, the better the result, because mm -hmm. the patron understands what the artist's doing, you know. Um, I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> one, there was a dude who, who actually said one day, you know what, Handel, them fireworks would work a whole lot better if we had some music to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, his instincts as a producer were, were on the money with this, you know, and he was very persistent with it, you know. I mean, the thing fell over once, it fell over a second time. When he picked up a second time, it was kind of bloody as well, you know. A lot of money had been lost. Mm -hmm. But he still, as you use the word, you know, persistence or tenacity, he stayed with it and eventually found the right family of people because that's what this job's about, you know. Getting the right mix and the collaboration, you know, has a com major effect on anything that's then, you know, creative. 